When people discuss which Far Cry game is their favorite, most people tend to answer 3, 4 or 5. However, there is also a pool of certain people who hail the second one as the best Far Cry game due to its realistic and hardcore gameplay. And from what I have read and heard, people either say they love or hate Far Cry 2. But why is this? It's almost the polar opposite of the aforementioned games. And I also want to ask this, does a game have to be fun to be a good game? The premise of Far Cry 2 is that you choose between 14 different mercenaries who are from all over the world and you are later transported in a taxi to a nearby town in an unknown country in Africa. All we know is that it's a failed Central African state where there is currently a civil war raging here between two warring factions, the UFLL and APR, that has been going on for years. Your mission is to find and kill the Jackal, a weapon stealer and smuggler who has supplied weapons to both sides since the civil war started. You suddenly catch malaria and blackouts. Welcome to Malaria Country, Merc. Ubisoft wanted to make a sequel after the successful Far Cry 1 game. However, a solution needed to be found because unfortunately the creators of the first game, Crytek, had signed a deal with EA the same year Far Cry 1 came out and they were now going to make a new title for EA, well, Crisis, rendering them unable to work on any new Far Cry projects. However, Ubisoft managed to strike a deal to buy the Far Cry franchise and the secrets of the Crytek engine. According to the developers of Far Cry 2, the aim was to rejuvenate the Far Cry universe using a new setting and mechanics, and this was mainly to differentiate it from its previous installment which was set on a tropical island and its console spin-offs which also took place in the jungle. And you have to understand that at this time the Far Cry brand was starting to struggle since a ton of other games started to place their games in the jungle as well. So they tried to just move away from the jungle overall, which is, you know, kinda ironic since Far Cry 3 would once again take place in the jungle. Now, the game would take place in Africa, and this is an interesting and new setting that many games don't even touch. And still, the tone would be drastically different compared to its previous installments. While Far Cry 1 had drawn inspiration from H.G. Wells' novel The Island of Dr. Moreau and had a divisive science fiction-like tone with a pinch of spy thriller in it, Far Cry 2, however, took inspiration from Joseph Conrad's 1899 novella The Heart of Darkness, as well as the film adaptation Apocalypse Now, and you know, it's relatively easy to see what tone they were going for based on just these two works. And the intent was for a darker, grittier and more realistic narrative and tone than its previous installment. A common theme with Heart of Darkness was for how far people would go and how much they would become like a monsters to survive and endure terrible circumstances. And another influence along the same lines was the novel Red Harvest, where the protagonist enters a lawless city and eliminates both sides of a deadly conflict. The game's conflicts drew inspiration from events around the city of Nairobi, which were seen as a emblematic of disputes in Africa. And moving away even further from Far Cry 1, the game's protagonist, Jack Carver, would not be featured as players did not, you know, remember him or, you know, dis they did not even dislike him because he was just so forgettable. Instead, Far Cry 2 went for a more blank slate approach, with a silent protagonist route to help the player get more immersed in the game. The buddies, or well, you know, the choosable characters, deliberately varied in age and ethnicity, reflecting real-life mercenaries who come from all corners of the earth wherever there is money to be made. The developers wanted the game design, as with the narrative, to maintain a realistic tone and style throughout the player's experience, the opposite of the first game, which was more, you know, unrealistic and unserious. The developers wanted to incorporate the African environment, guns jamming during combat and show a realistic version of the land that needed to be cleaner and more sterile. 
The player, mercenary's body, is kept hidden except during crucial scenes and cutscenes or healing animations, which was a request to promote the player's immersion into the world. And the minimal tutorial section was a deliberate choice with lead designer Pierre Rivest, saying the team wanted players to learn and combine the systems in their own way naturally, so it was quite clear that the developer's vision was to make the game as realistic and immersive for the player as possible. Of course, this would get praise, but also a lot of critique, but more about that later. After arriving in the town and catching malaria, you are bedridden, but a strange fellow is rummaging through your bag, and we find out it's the jackal who is reading the mission brief on himself that you carried with you. He mocks the notion that he can be killed and how you have failed, and that no one kills him and he decides when to die. He leaves the room, but he also leaves behind a machete and a pistol. And suddenly there is a lot of shooting and explosions outside, and you have to escape the town with your life. However, this sequence is scripted so that you will, you know, die sooner or later by the enemies, which prompts a cutscene where you are saved by one of the warring faction soldiers, who sees some potential in you. And from here on out, the game is completely open for you, and there is almost no instructions what to do or how to do it. It's complete freedom. You need to learn the game on your own, which is interesting, and it's pretty much fresh air compared to the handholding of many modern games. So, your first mission is that you're sent to a location to kill the guards and rescue a person, and this is kind of jaw-dropping and confusing if you have played many FPS games before, as you have a map to direct to the location, still you must physically pull up the map, which means you can't attack or defend yourself while looking, and furthermore, you can't tag enemies with your mini periscope which is hard to control for some reason, and there are no takedowns in this game like in newer Far Cry games, so sneaking is only good if you can entirely avoid the enemies or use silent weapons to take them out. However, it's always tricky because you only know where they are if you scout their patrol patterns, otherwise you can get flanked or ambushed if you have no idea where the enemy is since you can't see them through walls anymore or tag them. And after rescuing the person, which is randomized I believe, it's one of the playable characters that you could choose from, and these, you know, 13 others, will be your buddies. And you know, long story short, they can assist you if you die and pull you up, giving you an extra chance or lifeline. You know, it, it's a really cool mechanic, and it further brings you into this uh, death loop that nothing is really dead. But you know, not that death loop. The buddies will also give you different side quests at the bar where they all hang out. But after this introduction quest, you meet with the warring faction's leaders, who will be your primary quest givers throughout the game. And the mission structure in Far Cry 2 is one of the game's, you know, most unique ones. The mission structure is to accept quests from these warlords, and you can either go directly to the primary mission location, or, and this is the best part, you can go do the optional path where a buddy will call you and ask if you want to meet them up because they have an alternative solution to the mission. And personally, some of these are really cool, and they show the absolute carelessness your buddies have for the civilian population. For example, I did this optional route where my buddy came with a plane and dropped down, you know, chemicals, killing all green life in the mission location. And it just makes everything just look dead and deserted, you know, because there's now less food for the population and the destruction of nature is heartbreaking. But... He crashes the plane afterwards and now you need to help him because for some reason when doing the optional routes your buddies will get attacked afterwards and you need to save them. And if they die, they are permanently dead. So the coolness is seeing how all these optional routes to the main quests play out and you know it's really unique. And I wonder if more games you know should try this out. However, the issue is time. 
there is so much time, first of all, driving to the alternative location because it's often further away from the main location, and then you need to drive to the main location afterwards, and then you need to drive and save your buddy. And the alternative route makes every quest take more than double the time, and the rewards are thin. You get more stuff at your safe house, medicine, ammo, etc, etc. But also, with more reputation, your buddies will come and save you more often. Get up, get up, we're moving, and I mean now. But overall, I only did a few of these optional quests as they felt unnecessary and just way too time consuming. I mean, they are good for fleshing out the buddies as, you know, just mercs who are there for a buck and, you know, they are not morally good people. The story of Far Cry 2 is awful and genius at the same time. The voice acting could be better, with most actors delivering their lines at a 1.5 speed for some reason, and it's sometimes just awful dialogue without any emotion in it, and it's almost as if they only did one take because of limited time or something, and I'm not sure if they sped up the dialogue in the processing room, like, what what happened here? Yeah, boy, and you're a problem. Who are you working with? You got some of my guys killed at the hotel, did you know that? So now I think you work for me now. Get on out here, get yourself some gear. We got ammo and meds, weapons, whatever you need. I don't know you, but you know me. I'm the famous Prosper Kwasi. Are you good with a gun? You think you can hit a guy in a fast car? It's a big target. It'll be easy to hit. Is Kwasi talking to you, careful? No, he's talking to you, guy. If you want a job, we got one. It's good. Assassination. Chief of police. Bam. Careful. Tell him where to find this man. He's riding in a motorcade. It's a moving target. You'll have to pick a spot on the road and wait for him to come to you. That little penis will be in a great big SUV. The main characters though, that you meet as the right hand of one of the faction leaders and the jackal, they do a great job. But just like in Far Cry 1, balancing in-game music and the cinematic dialogue music is next to impossible. What is interesting however, is how much post-colonial theory suggests that the western world is exploiting the war, and to an extent, that is true from what we gather throughout the game, and it's partly due to the diamonds. However, there is also the side of the public who sees the struggle going on and donates funds to buy medicine, clean water for the struggling civilians, which is brutally exploited by the warlords who take these resources for themselves. Look at the story on television. There's pictures of these children in our camps dying with dysentery. It's very sad. You know, when people see these pictures, they'll break their hearts and have to send money to help. Not everyone will ever get those poor souls. It will eventually. But it has to come to us first. We know how to handle it. Yeah, sure you do. But you know, before we continue with the story, let's talk a little bit more about the new weapon and gameplay systems. The weapon system has had a complete overhaul from the previous game. You still have four guns, but they are in different categories now, with weapon slots being, well you know, side guns like uh, pistols or SMGs maybe, primary guns, secondary guns, and special weapons. And unlike in newer Far Cry games, where you can choose whatever combination of weapons you want, I kind of like this system, since it forces you to mix and match and also combine weapon times that are akin to your preferred playstyle. For example, if you're playing as a sniper or stealth build, your primary slot will be complete, you know, with the sniper, and then you need a light machine gun for when battle comes to close quarters, and with these two slots full, you will now have a problem with vehicles as you lack an RPG or explosion weapon. And I kind of like the system because there is no optimal loadout and it just forces you to try out different combinations. Fortunately, there is a huge variation of different weapons you can choose from, and some are just objectively better than others, especially those that you upgrade in higher tiers. 
There is also one unique weapon that I have never experienced in this way, which is the mortar. And you know in other games you often get a bird's eye perspective when using a mortar, but in Far Cry 2? Holy Jesus, you only measure by what degree you have the mortar on, which makes it hard as hell to calculate where it will hit, but again, it's realistic. I have never seen a mortar being used this realistic in a game before, and it is awesome. And one of the most notorious game mechanics is the weapon degradation. Weapons that you either pick up from enemies or ones you have used for a longer duration have a chance to jam when you shoot or reload. And you need to mash your reload button every time this happens. And this can happen several times in a row in a single mag, especially with an LMG that has a 100 bullet magazines. And since it's random, otherwise ordinary encounters become life or death situations. And if your gun is in a really terrible state, it can also explode. Yeah, it can explode and it will be broken and you can't repair it, I believe. And uh, yeah, you will either love or hate these mechanics. Unfortunately, I'm in the latter camp, but again, this game is the antithesis of control. Therefore, it makes sense to frustrate the player, even though they find it, you know, cheap. The way you buy and gain weapons is also different in this game. You can still pick up weapons from enemies, but I don't recommend this since they are just bad quality and unreliable and they will break or jam often. And they are usually only used for desperate situations. Instead, you wanna buy guns inside the various weapon stores on the map, from a unique computer that will remind you of the early 2000s. You have a vast amount of stuff you can buy, Everything from guns of different tiers, manuals for each weapon which can improve its reliability, silencer, accuracy etc. Manuals to reduce repair time for vehicles, you can buy storage boxes, there's also a really cool camo suit that will increase your stealth ability. And all of these cost different amounts of diamonds which you can collect quickly as you progress throughout the main story. And overall, it's an interesting change because many games sell weapons from weapon stores, but logging onto a computer to buy weapons, I really like it. Which reminds you of how this game and this war in Africa is just so internationalized, where you can order weapons from a computer and they will deliver the weapons from other countries. And who can forget one of the game's greatest feats? That fire spread. I just absolutely love the fire in this game, and it's not used to deal damage to enemies in this game. It's more of creating an obstruction, as the fire will spread to an insane degree which will force the enemies to move away from their covers or they will die. And this makes sense since it takes place in Africa during dry season, where a single spark can start a fire. And I often just throw up molotovs to observe the fire, and it's quite beautiful to just watch its destructiveness, but also gives new life to the next generation of plant life. And then there is the HUD. But also, what HUD? There is no HUD. I have never seen clearer in an FPS game before. It's like a fucking epiphany. I am so used to having a crosshair, health meter, stamina bar, weapon bar, compass, map, radar, distance meters, ammo, etc, etc, etc. So the first time I played Far Cry 2, I felt naked and unsure where to go. And I missed so many enemies just by looking or listening at the start. And it's, it's quite refreshing to not have anything on your screen. It's hard as hell, but satisfying as well. And it really and truly immerses you into the game where you only see what's in front of you. No markers, no see enemy through walls, just you and the screen. And it forces you to actually listen to where the enemy is and if they are trying to flank you. Oh, and you know, as I said, there is no crosshair, so it's just aiming down the gun to hit the enemy, which feels awkward at first, but you will get used to it quite fast. 
And of course, hitting targets further away without this scope is next to impossible though, but overall, it's a system that works well. But of course, some critique would be in uh, the map. When running or driving, I can assure you that for 80% of the time, it's gonna look like this. The map is essential to navigating where you're going since there's no other map or radar to follow, and I understand they want to make the game as immersive and realistic as possible, but this aspect was just annoying because it commits a deadly sin. It nullifies the absolutely gorgeous graphics and visuals because I'm just looking down the map all the time while driving instead of focusing on what's in front of me and the visuals. And I believe this is a case of not thinking it fully through when designing the map aspect, especially since you spend so much time driving from location to location. Alright. Let's continue with the main quests. Whenever you enter a quest giver's house and listen to their dialogue before you enter their exact room, and you hear them talk about strategy, money, and there are so many exciting dialogues surrounding how, for example, medicine won't go to the people. Instead, it will go to the warlords, and they know the commercial for poor starving children will make westerners donate money to them, and how they cannot let refugees leave the country as they provide a human shield, and without the people they will no longer get supplies from the outer world. And I believe that you learn much more about the world and the people when just listening in this game, it's never really told outright to you. Furthermore, I find it quite profound that they would delve into these concepts as people from the outside world who do not live in the war-torn Africa, but instead in the safety of their own houses watching these commercials regarding war, poverty, starvation, or lack of medicine, and out of their own heart donate money to a charity which will help deliver these necessary supplies. The issue is that it's hard to track where these supplies go, as local warlords will gather them and either keep them for themselves, or sell them for a highly inflated price. So in a way, if you're being a nihilist, or a realist, so in a way people who give to charity only prolong the actual conflict, which asks the question of whether or not the intent to donate to make a better world is enough when in reality it's used for that exact war that creates this suffering. And these warlords, they only see these people as naive, which is quite accurate, because although they have good intentions, reality is often different. Look at the story on television. There's pictures of these children in our camps dying with dysentery. You know, when people see these pictures, it'll break their hearts. They'll have to send money to help. Not of it will ever get to those poor souls. It will eventually, but it has to come to us first. We know how to handle it. Yeah, sure you do. And many games would not, you know, talk about anything on this subject. You know, critiquing charities and naive westerners and, and how they indirectly fund wars. And everyone around you in this game wants the civil war to continue because that means more profits. And this is especially true for the mercenaries and yourself because, well, you're a merc. The leaders always try to end the conflict by either trying to kill the other leaders of the opposing faction or create a temporary ceasefire. But you are tasked to stop them from signing a truce because that would mean the war might stop and you would lose profits. And again, it's a ever-spinning world of despair where no one wants it to end. And the game deals with a lot of greed. Just take the currency for example. Seeing as the country is destabilized and the national currency is now worthless, the only currency is diamonds. Furthermore, it also portrays it more that natural resources are Africa's only value. Not its people or currency, just diamonds coated in blood. The gameplay overall though in Far Cry 2 was entirely made to test your patience, to see if you will quit or persevere. Everything in the game wants to kill you. It starts with malaria, where you get these segments of losing vision and a timer, and if it runs out without you taking the medicine, you will get a game over, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Unfortunately, I never died of malaria. And it does not occur that often, I think it's you know, once every 3 or 4 hours when you play the game. And I think I did one side quest to get the pills and survive on them for multiple hours. And again, I appreciate the game's determination to make it as realistic and immersive as possible because in reality, yes, malaria will kill you. There is a reason why Europe never expanded more in depth into Africa and staying on the coasts until the 19th century when they invented vaccines against malaria because that shit is deadly and it's not to be messed around with. Why our playable character, who is a merc, did not take any vaccines to, against malaria going to Africa slightly bothers me, but I'm just going to assume our character is stupid. Everything in this game is surrounded by death, and yet it's, it's a tragic story of how, how this fictional country and Africa in general are portrayed as an endless struggle with death, being a nation that keeps on fighting with one another with no peace in sight. The enemy outposts, which are scattered throughout the map, are more or less road and bridge junctions that attack you if you get close and will drive after you if you try to drive by them. But the most egregious part is the respawn. Even if you kill the camp and get the cleared text, the camp is not liberated. Enemies will respawn later once again, so you can never truly get rid of your enemies. The outposts were initially intended to rebuild and repopulate slowly over time, but the team, or the developers, changed the design as it was possible for players to empty the entire game world and become bored. This is one of the worst aspects of the game, having enemy outposts respawn. Fortunately, Ubisoft made a change in every later installment. When you capture an outpost, it becomes friendly and friendly units will start to patrol the area. And be prepared to be rammed a lot. Because drivers in this game are some of the most aggressive ones I have ever experienced in a game. And it does not matter if it's a civilian or military vehicle. They will rubber band and catch up to you and ram or knock you off the road. The ones in a jeep are more or less impossible to drive away from unless you get a head start as the turret guy will hammer your vehicle until it starts to emit smoke. And when this happens to a vehicle, it gets slower. You have a wrench that does not take up any of your four weapon slots, which it does in Far Cry 3 for some reason? And the time it takes to repair it is based on how much damage the vehicle has taken. So with all of these annoyances in mind, such as weapon degradation, malaria, respawning command posts, enemies that will chase you to the ends of the earth, and a game where your vehicle will be shot and slowed down, and you have to repair it so much this game could be defined as mechanic simulator. Everything in the game is there to annoy you, to try and immerse you and to tell you how realistic the game is. But the question is, is it worth it? Because a lot of this is not even fun. Some games are built on dying and trying again. Dark Souls and Undertale are two great examples where the game mechanic is purely built on death. In Dark Souls 1, the undead one is immortal and will come back to life again and again and the only way to lose is genuinely giving up, hence becoming a husk. Dark Souls is surrounded by death and combines the player's will to continue through adversity as the only way to lose is to give up and put down the controller. Undertale, on the other hand, is more or less about determination. Similarly, you are immortal as long as you don't give up. Every time you die, it's your determination that keeps on reviving you. And just like Dark Souls, you indeed only lose when you give up. The one closest in terms of tone to Far Cry 2 is probably The Last of Us Part 2. However, there are stark differences. The Last of Us 2 is drowned in nihilism when the leading producer Neil Druckmann says we don't do fun here at Naughty Dog. A lot of the narrative bombarded the audience into thinking what the game's message is, telling them instead of them thinking for themselves, ob observing and taking in information as passive observers. And instead, you know, it just hammers the message of revenge bad without any depth. Far Cry 2 is the opposite. 
The game never directly tells you how you are a terrible person, what you are doing is wrong, or what the message is trying to convey. However, if you personally really start to piece together what the jackal and other leaders are telling you, you begin to understand the underlying message of Far Cry 2 by playing the game and everything it sends your way. And how everything in Far Cry 2 is actively trying to kill the player. Everything is just literally hell. The game could be seen as if it's taking place in hell. All the mercenaries and buddies you meet, they're not good people. They all come from different corners of the earth and are willing to do anything as long as they are paid. And Far Cry 2 could literally be seen as a universal hell where people from all over the world are stuck, regardless of politics, ethnicity or religion, gathering here in this country to kill each other. But as long as you don't quit the game and give up, you will beat the game and become stronger, having endured everything the game tried to throw at you. After doing a ton of various main quests for both the warring factions, you are tasked to kill one of the leaders to end the conflict. But after killing him, you are betrayed by the other faction that hired you to kill him, and you are left for dead. There is a colossal sandstorm brewing, and you manage to escape the vehicle and find an abandoned house where you collapse and fall to sleep, dying of your wounds. But you suddenly wake up and again, the jackal of all people is there tending to your wounds, telling you how it does not matter if you kill the leaders because someone else will always replace them. And again, it's just a never ending conflict where you can't solve this war by killing thousands of soldiers or even one leader. The only thing you have done is to make the war even crueler, where men will be lined up against the wall, shot, children's arms that will be chopped off, and the women. Yeah. The jackal sees all the ones involved as being part of a cancer as they keep on taking and taking until there's nothing left and spreading. And it will spread to the next place when they're done here. And the only way to stop the cancer is to quarantine it and let the cancer kill each other. Since they are the only ones there without anything healthy to latch onto like the civilians. And they will eventually kill each other until there is nothing left. In Nordic mythology, there are many interpretations of hell or just hell, and according to some, it's almost the same as Valhalla but opposite. Fighting forever without any glory or honor, there is no winning or losing, just mindless killing. And that's a lot like Far Cry 2, where you are forced to kill people regardless of how many people you kill, be it ordinary foot soldiers or leaders, it never ends. For every leader you kill, someone else will take their place. Every outpost you kill, they will be replenished later on. This mainly comes true when the first person who rescues you at the start of the game becomes the leader of one of the warring factions and hence another enemy. The only thing you have that resembles some goodness in the game are the buddies. Although not good people, they are willing to help each other if their lives are at risk, or if the relationship is close enough. And they will later ask you to find a briefcase full of diamonds located at the peace conference, and with those diamonds you and your merc buddies can afford them to buy a plane out of this godforsaken country. But in the end, when picking up the diamond case by one of your buddies, you are ambushed by all your former buddies, and they will try to kill you. And now you have a choice, you can either kill them all, or you can run away. But anyway, when you be tasked to kill this leader at the peace conference and grab the briefcase, you are once again met with a jackal who seems quite friendly to you now and talks about how the peace agreement was just a farce, a spectacle for the outside world, so they would stop, put international sanctions and pressure on them to stop the war. And the more eyes you have upon you, it's harder to make money from their illegal ways. The Jackal tells you how he will stop them and how they will curse his name for years after he's done with them. He knows exactly what type of person you are because he also used to be a merc, so he knows you better than you know yourself. The location for Far Cry 2 was a great one. Choosing Africa was quite a risk since there are few games that take place on the continent. 
And I mean, I think we had a really great example from what we have seen uh, news media or gaming journalists say about the uh, other game that took place in Africa called um, Resident Evil 5. In the 2020s, in a post-Black Lives Matter world, there is only one acceptable response to a white man shooting waves of Africans for an entire video game. No. Now we'll begin by... Oops. <laughs> oh, did you see that jerk? <laughs> he dropped his nose! <laughs> so yeah, a lot of games try to just stay away from this continent for this reason. It was decided not to set the game in a real country so as to not limit the in-game environmental variety. And when thinking about the region to emulate in-game, the team opted for Kenya, due to its variety of environments within and around its borders with Uganda, Ethiopia and Tanzania. In July of 2007, Ubisoft sent a team of the game's developers to Africa to carry out research for the game. Their research took them to Kenya and parts of Tanzania. They spent two weeks traveling around the region and camping out in the savannah, and the trip allowed them to observe the local arch architecture and environment firsthand. And, you know, in addition to their guides telling them about the local vegetation and weather cycles. And after they came back with all of these resources that they had brought with them, they realized they had gotten the game design so wrong and made several changes to emulate the local environment properly this time. The game also features a decent amount of side content, but it still follows the theme of how everything is still kill, kill, kill. The mission structure does not really deter much from the main mission, except for the underground missions, which are in reality obligatory as you gain malaria pills from them. And it's just go from points to points, picking up passports, and go to point B, where you hand them over to civilians who are trying to escape the country, and you will get your pills from them. And this can vary between 1 to 3. Yeah. One to three pills. Thanks. And yes, these are just annoying and they feel like a chore. It still follows the theme that civilians are off hands, they are not seen on the map and you'd never really see them. In a sick way, it's almost like, you know, they are not in the game. Like, literally. You know when kids are playing war and the rules are you can't hit someone who is not in the game. And I really like this dialogue from Mike from Better Call Saul. Every other person is okay to kill because, well, they are in the game. They know the risks of entering the military, the mercenaries, and there is a high risk of dying. But there is a great reward in terms of money. All of you are in the game. Therefore, the people you kill, be it soldiers, leaders or prison guards, all know the rules of the game because they are part of it. The most essential side missions are the weapons shops side quests, which are given to you by the weapon store vendors at different times and locations throughout the game. And these are convoy missions where you need to destroy different weapon shipments, which are direct competition to the quest giver store. You just need to kill a truck transported by varying degree of jeeps, depending on what quest tier it's on. But the reward of completing this quest is so satisfying as it allows you to buy higher tier weapons from the stores. And lastly, there are the assassination missions, where you pick up these strange requests from radio towers, where an unknown voice tasks you with killing various targets around the map, and the reward is in diamonds. And these are just basic track and kill missions. Nothing new, nothing exciting, but it still reinforces the notion that you are just a mercenary who will kill for money. And in Far Cry 2, gone are the medipacks. Instead you have semi-health regeneration if you're out of combat, and this time you also have morphine that you manually inject, and this can be interrupted if you are shot at, but it adds to realism. There are also over 60 different injury animations, depending on the extent of the injury, you know, if your grenade hits you, if you are shot by a bullet, or if you take fall damage. And the game is difficult, as the AI can spot you from miles away, especially if they are up in guard towers. And there is also a realistic mod that people who play a lot of Far Cry 2 use, which makes the game Super realistic in terms of guys in t-shirts die in only a few hits, but unfortunately, you yourself also die in just a few hits. 
The only way to travel quickly in the game is to use the five different bus stations at the corners and center of the map. And there are two maps. And half the game is played on the bigger one. The second one comes into play later in the main story, which is full of mountains, so traversing around the map is more annoying and challenging. There is also a diamond tracker minigame where your GPS will start to blink green corresponding to the distance between you and a briefcase. And inside these briefcases there are diamonds. However, the rewards for these are relatively tiny, because you only get 1 to 3 diamonds for each briefcase you find. When you meet the jackal for the last time towards the end of the game, he monologues over how almost all civilians are out of the country, nearing the borders, fleeing into its nearby neighbors, and how war and death are the only way to cleanse this country. Although the civilians are not to be hurt since, you know, it's not their war and they are not part of it. And the jackal is more or less a forgotten antagonist of the Far Cry franchise, he truly becomes interesting if you have paid attention to what he's saying and what the game itself is trying to tell you. And of course it's up to your own interpretation, but eh. The ending of the game is probably some of the best we have ever seen in a Far Cry game. Its ending is actually something compelling. When the Jackal, the man you were hired to kill and has been your primary goal from the start of the game, but has slowly, through different interactions, given you a broader vision of what's actually going on in the country, and how he's giving you a chance to be part of the solution. Although the Jackal has provided weapons for both warring factions for years, who have killed countless of people, including civilians, now wants to make amends as he sees these factions and mercenaries as cancer that needs to be purged from the land. And he has repeated this notion several times. And it becomes clear that he is trying to cleanse his own sins that he bears through all the lives lost because of him. And there are now millions of refugees that are trying to get across the border, but the soldiers of APR and the front are coming after them to either kill them or drag them back over the border to use as leverage towards outside powers. The only ones who die today are the ones who have it coming. And again, it's very close what Mike says, whether you are actively participating in the game or not. The Jackal will now give you two different choices. Since the dynamite detonation cords to close the valley behind the refugees to stop the approaching soldiers have malfunctioned, someone needs to explode the dynamite manually, but it will kill the person in the process. You know, to me, this choice symbolizes how the player feels guilty about everything they have done in the game and may be seeking redemption in a classic heroic sacrifice. The other choice is the briefcase of diamonds that you have brought with you, and it will be used to bribe the border guards to let all the millions of refugees get safely across the border. Still, he also says how the person who does this choice must also shoot themselves afterwards, not to leave any trace behind and to wipe away the guilt thoroughly. On the other hand, the diamond briefcase has two meanings. You can give the diamonds and put a bullet in your head. Or you can provide the diamonds and then escape. And no one would know the better. So more or less a cowardly way out of this. Of course, we don't know which choices the main character makes as the screen turns black, so it's up for your own interpretation. The Jackal is an interesting character. He might not be as famous as Vaz, Pagan Ming or Father Joseph, but to me, he's probably the most profound character to analyze. Like the others mentioned, they have a tangible impact when you meet them, just completely taking over the scene with fantastic writing and performances, but they lack depth. At least death to make the player think what's right and wrong. The Jackal, on the other hand, is an awful villain. <laughs> Riding is so-so and he's not really that memorable at all in his scenes, but what he has is the depth regarding the last choice and why he suddenly wants to help civilians escape the country. So it's quite tragic how when people discuss Far Cry villains, the Jackal never even comes up in the conversation. And the writers wrote the Jackal as a contrast to the more simplistic antagonist of Far Cry 1, being an amoral pragmatist who would eventually understand the damage caused by his action and take extreme measures to rectify it. 
And there is a term called acceleration, be it practical or political. You know, when you want a change faster, you drive something into overdrive, and instead of prolonging the conflict between the UFLL and APR, the jackal simply wants the conflict to end faster instead of dragging out the civil war for many more years. So is the jackal evil? No. Is he a good person? No. He's a flawed human with a destructive mindset towards human nature. He's trying to reprimand all the suffering he has caused and offers you the same choice to clean your soul. Because remember, you have killed so many people throughout the game. You have accepted every single mission, regardless of side. You have no real morals in this war. And you're willing to side with anyone who pays you. Assassinations, destruction, sabotage, everything without question. And although everyone involved was in the game, you can't be in the game forever, because sometimes you have to quit, either a free will or a bullet to the brain. The Jackal might not be the most well-known villain, but he's sure the most human out of all of them in the Far Cry franchise. So with all of this said, did I like the game? I fucking hated it. And I think that's a good thing, because everything I detailed, how everything in the game wants to kill you and make you want to give up, how the game's mechanics were made to annoy and pressure the player throughout the game, then I think personally it's an awful game mechanic. But I persevered and took everything the game threw at me. Am I glad I played the game? Yes, but I'm probably not going to replay it. Because although I hate the game, I still respect the living shit out of it. There are so many decisions deviating from the standard FPS genre and tropes and creating something new. Still, the game made me think more than other games in terms of morality and how everything in the game was tied together to give an experience that I probably will not forget in a million years. So long. Thank you all so much for watching and please remember to share, like and subscribe. Until next one, bye guys.